So my, uh, what, else, what I'm speaking about today is the application of current FDA statute to rare disease drug development. So this is a Fabry case study. Um, so similar to what you've already heard, I'll give you a bit of an overview on the disease, the product, and then point out some key examples where we've already seen the FDA advancing the regulatory framework, and then highlight areas of opportunity for further innovation. Um, quick disclaimer, the views and opinions that you're about to hear are mine and mine alone. They do not represent Amicus or Every Life Foundation. Um, a little bit of information on Amicus. We are a global burgeoning biotech company. Our portfolio consists of small molecules, biologics, and we're looking to enter the gene therapy space. We have products that span from the non-clinical through the commercial stage. Bit of a Overview on Fabry, it's a rare and devastating X-linked genetic disease. It's characterized by a deficiency in alpha-galactosidase A enzyme, which ultimately results in the fat buildup of global trial salaramide, which leads to a negative impact on the kidney's function. A number of different morbidity includes gastrointestinal issues, pain and hearing loss, and early mortality includes renal failure, cardiac failure, sudden death, and stroke. Similar to all of the other diseases that have been discussed thus far, this is an orphan disease recognized worldwide. Um, from 2001 through now, there's been an evolution of the understanding of Fabry disease. I won't go into this in grave detail, but it involves the definition of Fabry as it pertains to classic versus late onset, um, understanding how the disease manifests in males and females. One of the things I'll point out is that our development program includes the largest number of females that have been studied in this disease. It's also been an understanding of how genotype and phenotype play a part in the disease, as well as missense and amenable variants. Before moving on, I'll just point out that, <clears throat> excuse me, prior to the approval of Gallifold uh, just last month, Fabrizyme was the only approved treatment here in the U.S. Um, under subpart E. And outside of the U.S., Replegal um, received full approval. Um, likewise, Gallifold outside of the U.S. has full approval, and in the U.S. we are under subpart H accelerated approval. Very briefly about the mechanism of action here. Gallifold is an orally administered small molecule that works with certain variants that we consider to be amenable. In these patients who have amenable variants, um, it binds to the unstable form, excuse me, I went kind of quick there, of alpha gal A enzyme here in the endoplasmic reticulum. And by binding to that unstabilized mutant form, it stabilizes it and allows it to traffic to the lysosome. Once in the lysosome, it, it clears the accumulated disease substrate, GL3. And the importance of that clearance is that clearly um, too much GL3 leads to cell damage, which impacts the kidney, eventually leading to total kidney failure or end-stage renal disease. A little, about the a little bit about the Gallifold development program and exposure. As I stated earlier, we have the largest development program in Fabre, which is comprised of 20 clinical studies. The mean duration of exposure is 3.6 years. The maximum duration of exposure, 11 years. We have 591 unique patients and healthy volunteers throughout the development program, of which 402 were exposed to megalostat. We studied 51 amenable variants in our program, um, and I'd like you to just keep that in mind as that's going to be a really key point later on in this presentation. Thus far, 21 patients have been treated in global expanded access programs, and in the post-marketing setting, we've treated more than 450 patients. We conducted two pivotal studies in our uh, clinical development program. The first, study 011, which was megalostat versus placebo. The primary endpoint here was the reduction in KICGL3. The second, study 012, which is megalostat versus ERT, that's the active comparator, and the primary endpoint was the annualized rate and change of glomular filtration rate, otherwise known as GFR. In all of our clinical studies and in the post-marketing setting, Gallifold is found to be safe, um, generally safe and well-tolerated. There have been no signals of safety concern in the post-marketing setting thus far. 
Also want to point out that in L11, it was a six-month double-blind placebo-controlled randomized study with a 12-month open-label extension. And in 012, um, the treatment period was 18 months, and that followed with a 12-month open-label extension as well. After both of those studies concluded, there was the option for patients to transition into an open-label long-term extension study. This is a quick synopsis of where Gallifold is approved throughout the world. Um, since our first approval in Europe in 2016, we've been approved in a number of countries. That first approval was based on study 012, the ERT controlled study, with the primary endpoint being the annualized rate and change of GFR. And as you can see, um, all of the other countries where we've received approval thus far, it's been the same basis of approval in the US, where we recently received approval. It's the only study that was based on 011, the placebo-controlled study, with the primary endpoint being the reduction in KICGL3. So I'll take you into a couple examples here of how we've seen um, innovation through Gallifold. Very broadly, Gallifold is indicated for treat the treatment of Fabry patients with amenable variants. Um, amenability is based on defined criteria and is tested by our in vitro HEC assay, which was developed by Amicus. And essentially, the use of this assay is what has established Gallifold as a precision medicine. Generalizability of the amenable variance in the labeling um, was seen through the application of the 2017 guidance that's been discussed um, a few times earlier. Um, as I said before, we studied 51 amenable variants in the study. However, at the time of approval, we were able to receive 348 amenable variants in our label, which is a really huge deal. Um, one of the presentations earlier, you've seen that they, when they received approval, I believe they had four or five amenable variants, and over the past couple of years, they've been able to increase that. We've seen a real push with the FDA here in allowing us to include 348 variants at the time of approval, despite only having studied 51. Now, while that was a really great advancement of the regulatory landscape, um, there are opportunities for further innovation. Uh, these areas that I'm about to discuss um, represent them. So as you've seen on the slide previously, I think two slides up when I spoke about the approvals, you saw that in all of the other countries we were approved um, with study 012, the active comparator. Global harmonization of clinical trials and the use of endpoints is a real key um, point of innovation for rare diseases as we've seen or as we've heard rather being spoken of with some of our, my other colleagues this afternoon. The time to approval in major geographies can be synchronized through the harmonization of endpoints and clinical trial design. I think that parity to comparators in special cases should is something that the is something that is important in rare diseases. Again, if we take a look at where we've been approved thus far, being based on 012, but in the US, being approved um, on the placebo-controlled study. Concordance among, the among regulators is key in this space, which would allow us to optimize the patient population. The application of regulatory framework should be flexible, allowing for key data and pivotal studies to be reflected. So again, we've conducted 20 studies in our clinical development. It is the largest development in Fabre. However, the US label does not reflect that. There's minimal data included in the label as it pertains to 012, causing a divergence in global labeling on clinical data. And it does not allow prescribers to have all of the relevant information that they would need. The third point here is the use of innovative and novel approaches to communicate pertinent labeling information. In Europe, at the time of the approval, they accepted the use of including a link to a website that allows prescribers to search for amenable mutations. That's something that has also been accepted at the time of approval in other regions. Here in the US, it's something that's still being discussed. However, this is another area where we've seen that there's still that opportunity to take innovation up a notch and allowing there to be harmonization in the global development as well as the global approvals. 
a few recommendations in general um, to expedite drug development for rare diseases. Again, this concept of streamlined global development and collaborating and having open communication among regulators, the harmonization of clinical trial design and endpoint selection. We're hoping that through the July 2018 guidance that was issued, um, we'll start to see some more of that harmonization within this rare disease space. The alignment with FDA on how guidances and regulations should be implemented in special cases, this was touched upon a bit earlier as well. Um, and having some more streamlined communication between the different branches within the FDA and also having open communication with industry that allows us to really be on the same page in terms of how these guidances and regulations are being applied in practice to clinical development. The third point here is non-competitive information sharing. Um, information that's obtained from natural history and from disease registries is extremely important in clinical development for rare diseases. Having that information can help to positively impact our clinical designs, again, and ensuring that our development is streamlined globally. In addition, evolution of thinking that may impact development. This was a point that was touched on earlier as well, I believe, um, by Brad. And it goes hand in hand with transparency and communication and ensuring that as there's an evolution of thinking, whether it be about the disease and points that may be used, that that information is proactively shared with sponsors. Again, allowing us to ensure that our development is still on track, that we are developing according to the expectations expectations of the FDA and ultimately that will allow us to have clear approval pathway in the U.S. and ensuring that there isn't such a divergence with global um, submissions and approvals. So you've seen these next two points mentioned already. I think that um, we've seen that there's this positive trend towards advancing the regulatory landscape. Um, as it pertains to these two new guidances that were issued in April 2018, we'd like to see some proactive communication with industry on implementing these guidances, um, again, so that we can ensure that as we are developing um, our drugs, we are developing them hand in hand with the FDA and that we're aware of where, what their thinking is and ensuring that they are being applied um, in practice with our development. At this time, I'll take any questions if anyone has them.